Front Row Rugby. Interviews with rugby legends with Peter Stemmett. Springbok legend and 1995 Rugby World Cup winner Kurbis Visser is my guest today on Front Row Rugby. Kurbis, welcome. Thanks very much. It's great to chat you. Now, just before we begin the conversation, let's take a look at the trivia question for today. Name the Springbok who scored a hat-trick of tries against the All Blacks at Ellis Park in a 2004 Tri-Nations test. If you know the answer to that, you can put it in the comment section down below. We'll also find out if Kurbis knows the answer to that question, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. So Kurbis, there were two reasons that I wanted to have you on Front Row Rugby. Firstly, you're one of the legends of our sport and we love you and we want to celebrate you as we do with all the Springbok heroes and legends from the past. But also, I've had some guests on here, like Adrian Richter and Ian MacDonald, who have told me some stories about you and how you were very much the prankster in the team back in those days. And I thought that it wasn't fair for them to come here and tell us about you without putting you up and giving you the chance to defend yourself. So I think let's begin by delving deeply psychologically, right? Back at school, were you the class clown? Well, some people will say yes, but I, I, I deny that categorically and I plead the fifth, I mean, like anybody would, you know. So, no, I just, I just think I was, I was born and blessed with, a, with a, a fairly good sense of humor. I love people with a good sense of humor. And I think humor is part of life, uh, you know, healthy humor. And, and, uh, and, and also, of course, part of the great game of rugby. I mean, I've had some great chuckles in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the moment, in a test match where all the guys will break down uh, and laugh about a chirp somebody gave or gave the ref, whatever. So, so I think it's part of sport. I think it's a very important part of sport. What was the best prank that you pulled during your time with the Springboks? There's a few I unfortunately cannot tell you about, but uh, I, one comes to mind, and you mentioned Arden Richter and Ian McDonald and these guys, um, guys that I were very privileged to play with and against. And, and, and before I answer your question, that's one of the great things about sport and in this case, rugby, is that uh, some of my best friends today is guys that I played against, not with in a team. And that just shows you the beauty of this of this game, is that uh, even if you play against each other, there's still mutual respect. Uh, and, and a guy comes to mind is a guy like Ruben Kruger, which was an amazing player, but an incredible human being. And, and we never played with uh, each other provincially-wise, but with, obviously, you know, together for the Springboks. And, and we became really very close friends and that's the beauty of sport i think it teaches you so much about life and i'm a huge advocate of sport for any kid doesn't matter at what level as long as you participate and in this regard team sport i think is of crucial importance to any youngster because it teaches you as you know incredible life lessons but to, to come back to your question it was uh, uh, during the world cup in, in 95 we were going out to the waterfront in cape town as a team you know obviously for a few lemonades uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we had a great time and had to be back a certain curfew time because Kitsch was very strict. Uh, he allowed us a lot of leverage, but we never crossed the line. You know, we, we had a great, great relationship with him as a coach, but also a, a huge respect. Anyway, so as we left the lemonade bar um, on our way back to, to the hotel, um, the boats were coming in we are with a fresh catch of fish and, uh, and, and the guys on the boat obviously recognized us and they all approached so we had a great chat and they said good luck to you guys and for the rest of the world cup and so forth and so forth and uh, uh and presented us with a snook a freshly caught snook well we didn't want to sort of insult them and we gladly accepted myself and rudolph strally accepted this the snook and we all went back to the hotel and then and uh, Rudolf, always time for a prank as well, you know, got this bright idea that we should deliver this fresh snook uh, to somebody's bed who's not back at the hotel yet. Uh, and and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, for Mark Andrews, um, he was probably somewhere out uh, still having a few uh, lemonades, um, uh, not back at the hotel. And, and we put the snook in the bed with the head on the pillow, tucked it in nicely and just left it there. Now, now... Um, when Peter Hendricks, who was his roommate at that stage, came back to the hotel, he saw this thing and he thought, well, this is weird. But anyway, he got into his bed. And he said about an hour later, Mark returned, got into this bed and <laughs> realized the smell and the slippery um, and, and went ballistic. That snook traveled for a couple of days in the hotel from room to room, starting to decompose. And obviously, as you can imagine, the chaos that was 
that was going on in the hotel. So much so that the, the GM of the hotel said, guys, it's fun, but this is no more. Please can we get rid of this fish? So it's it's those kind of things, you know, that, that you do to keep your mind occupied while, while still focusing on why you're there. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? I'm glad we could have a lack of laugh about that. Okay, Corpus, let's get a little bit more serious now. 1993, Durban. You're about to make your test day before the Springboks against France. So Olivier Rumar uh, was going to be one of your direct opponents that day. How nervous were you? Look, it's obviously, I mean, uh, Peter, as you know, that's every young boy's dream is to play for, for South Africa. And that's what you work towards. And yeah, against the French, um, I, I know the French quite well. I played there as a student uh, in a town called Strasbourg with Dion Oosthuizen for about seven months. We lived there and then later in Carcassonne, which is near Toulouse. So I, I quite knew at that stage the French way of life and the way they play rugby. They're a very emotional uh, um, a group of people. Um, I always say they cry when they win, they cry when they lose, they cry the whole bloody time. But they play emotional rugby, you know, that's what makes them so dangerous. So it was quite unique for me to make my debut against the French, uh, and as you say in Durban, with the likes of far more experience. Oaks like Willie Schmidt was in the side, and Rudy Fasaki was my was my teammate, uh, Nas Berta, all these guys. So it was it was a it was a, a good Springbok side, but you know, we were just back from isolation, so we had a, a a tour to Australia the previous year, which was sort of a mixed reaction and so forth. It was a big day. It's a massive day because, you know, all you realize sitting there before and running onto the field for your debut, you think, well, this is what I was dreaming about since I was a kid. This is what I sacrificed, worked hard for and so forth. But then the nerves start kicking in. You, know, you don't want to disappoint yourself. You don't, don't want to disappoint your team. You don't want to disappoint what you're wearing because I've always sat in a change room for every game I was privileged to play for South Africa and looked at the jersey and, and then and then a little voice speaks in your mind and says don't disappoint every oak who wore that same jersey before you for the last hundred odd years you know and talk about pressure but that's the beauty of it that's the rich tradition uh, and and that's the way it should be you know you must always remember to to hand over that jersey to the next guy in better condition in better shape uh, than the previous players that build up to that alongside with you. Why do you think it took another two years before you played a test again? Well, <laughs> I can answer you twofold. Uh, I was actually dropped after my debut. Um, we had a coach by the name of John Williams who uh, had other ideas. Uh, I wasn't good enough according to him. And, uh, you know, he rather picked uh, some players who played at that stage for the Northern France while B side. Um, but let's leave it there. Um, he, he, he probably had his reasons, but it's just oh, obviously very disappointing. And, and, and just, you know, I said to myself, look, this is life, you know, it's up to you to prove him wrong, um, which thankfully it happened in, uh, later. Um, so, yeah, it hurt at the time. It, it does hurt and it, it did hurt, but um, um, maybe he did me a favor, uh, you know, to, to get back into it. And, and, and I take no credit whatsoever, you know. Thank the good Lord for the opportunity to, to keep on playing, to be motivated, to play with other players, to meet people like Fitz Christie that crossed our path at the Lions and the players that I played with. And I can mention a lot of them and the players that I played against. Um, I give them all the credit and the great game of rugby. I was very fortunate, very blessed to have met these people at the right time. And and when Kitch joined us, you know, we were we were very up and down, irregular transvaal side. And he started building a group of players, which um, would become the core of a world champion side later on. And, and we had such an incredible time um, uh, together. So, yeah, I was after the first misfortune, I was very blessed. And you were back in the team uh, on the eve of the Rugby World Cup in 1995 to take on Western Samoa, as they were still called in those days. By making that starting 15, how confident were you of making the World Cup squad? Look at that stage, the Lions side was probably the best provincial side in world rugby. We won everything, as you would recall that year. It just never been done before. We won the Yardley Goal uh, evening night series. We won the Curry and we won uh, the, the Super title. Um, so so that's been the, the the pattern always for any World Cup team that won a World Cup. You'll, you will go back in history and, and see that always, and, and it's all logical, makes up the core of the group. Um, and that's exactly what kids did. Um, he uh, built a really great side. We had a phenomenal side, but we had a, a side that was very level-headed. We worked exceptionally hard. We had guys involved in the Lions, like Ray Moore, who's probably the best 
and most fanatical fitness guru I've ever seen. I love Ray Tupitz. He was an incredible player. He's an incredible coach. But one thing, when he uh, when he got that look, and we as a tight forwards never liked that look because when he got that look, in, uh, uh, Peter in his eyes, we ran until we spat blood, to say the least. But we were incredibly fit. We were probably the fittest side in world rugby at that stage. Um, and the team just became unbelievable friends. And, and he started building a core on that provincial side, as you said, from 93 to 94. And then eventually 95 was, was the core of this squad, uh, um, which, which thankfully, and thank God, you know, um, uh, brought the bacon home, as the guys would say. Um, uh, and, and, and I was fortunate and blessed to be part of that group. You didn't play in the opening match of the tournament against Australia, but then you did come in for the second fixture. That was against Romania, also at Newlands in Cape Town. Uh, Adrian Richter was on this show a couple of episodes ago. I'll put a link to that over here. And he commented on how difficult it was to play against Romania because they don't really play structured rugby and, uh, and that it's difficult to combat them. What would you say? It is, but just to go back, you know, you mentioned the Samoan test, which we, we beat them convincingly. We played great rugby at Ellis Park. Um, and, and, and to this day, my favorite rugby ground in the world, the packed Ellis Park, um, is so intimidating It's uh, for the opponents, but so supporting for the home side of Green and Gold and the fanatical uh, people sitting there. It's just an incredible uh, venue for, for rugby and, and very friendly towards not only the Lions side, but also the national side when we play there. But... Uh, I mean, I, I was in great form. I, I, I expected to to be uh, to play the opening game against the defending world champions at that stage, which was Australia, as in Newlands, as you as you mentioned. Um, but I didn't make the side. I made the bench. I was disappointed, but I thought, well, you know, I've been here before. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just fight back and and then played every game until the final after that. So, um, but the, the competition was really. Great in this squad, but also very healthy because everybody know the guy in form is going to play. It's about the team and about certain choices, as you saw later on, which some people frowned about that pitch made. But in the end, had this plan and it worked out. And sometimes it didn't make sense. But let me tell you one thing: the guys bought into it. They believed in it. They supported each other. That's why we were such an incredibly close family. Uh, and, and, and I believe that contributed to the success. But going back to Romania, Adrian was exactly uh, spot on. Um, it was a tough game. It was, a, it was one of those bruising battles. It wasn't spectacular, but we had to grind it out. The Romanians probably didn't have the skills, but they had the heart, they had the guts. Um, they were like uh, uh, new kids on the block. I remember they arrived in Cape Town with no sponsor. They probably had no kit bags, nothing. And, and then Morning to Plessis and, 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 the, and the rest of the squad, we decided, but after we played these guys, I mean, they loved the game so much, I could hardly or barely speak proper English, but they were so committed to the game and passionate. And, and as I said, we had to fight a big fight to win this game and keep it, uh, you know, win our pool. But um, we spoke to some of the sponsors, we then gave them a whole kit, the whole team. And those guys were crying, you know, they were, they were so uh, grateful and, and again, proved their love for the game. And so forth, but it was a tough one. Uh, th that's where, where it started our journey towards the final year. And, and, and I recall very uh, clearly, Kitch, right in the beginning, there's two ways there's a high road and there's a low road that we can go to a possible final. And we looked at this high road and we looked at this low road who we possibly can play. And we said, We're going to take the high road because we want to not, we don't want to uh, come across the All Blacks, which was the favorite at that stage. On our way to the final, we'll rather get them in a final, which maybe sound arrogant at, at this stage, but that was really the way we spoke. And, and we sort of could plot our way, um, take the, the, the high road, and then uh, rather play an all black team, which is a dream final. Um, very little did we know at Ellis Park in South Africa in front of our own crowd. I mean, that's a dream uh, final for any guy in, a, in the green and gold and for the all blacks. We're going to talk about that final in just a moment. But before that, there was a semi-final against France in Durban. And I think it's fair to say that the conditions that day were atrocious. We know that Louis Lake did everything in his power to make sure that the match did go ahead. But I think if we try to be objective, Corbus, and you look at those conditions, and let's say that the match wasn't being played in South Africa, that it was somewhere else at a different time in history, what are the chances that that match would have gone ahead? Look, uh, spot on, atrocious, I think, is, is even an understatement. I mean, the, even the people in Durban said they've never seen so much rain in such a short time ever in the history of, 
I mean, in that game, you'll recall, Peter, it started three hours late, roughly. There was not a drop of lemonade in the whole of King's Park left because the guys were sitting in, in the rain. They didn't want looking for this game to start. And we warmed up three times and then sat down again and then warmed up again. And now you can start thinking, what kind of trick does this play psychologically? Because you know, you're now in playoff phase. It's on the day. So if you don't win, you're gone. Um, and then there's talk about, well, probably the game might not take place because of the danger of the water levels on the field. So if there was any doubt about the Type 5 being good swimmers, it was washed away, excuse my, my pun, that day because the Type 5 we had to swim. It was an unbelievable game. I think not only physically but mentally, I think, showed and mentally proved that this team is strong enough mentally also to go all the way. So the pressure that was, uh, that was absorbed beforehand and during that game in atrocious conditions, um, I think just proved to the South African public out there that we, that we are here, we're serious to get to a final and win this World Cup in South Africa, which was what we worked for building up to that, to that World Cup. In the end, the decision whether this was left to Mr. Derek Bevan, the, the Welsh referee, to take the responsibility and the accountability for 30 players on the field because, you know, he agreed that we should play. Because if that game didn't uh, take part, we would have been out of the World Cup on a technicality. You know, uh, thank you, Mr. Bevan, uh, for, for giving us a bit of a hand. There. In the week leading up to the final, what would you say was the difference between nerves and confidence? I, I, I firmly believe, and, and, and I believe this is the thing in sport and in business and in life, um, um, that success breeds confidence. So the more successful you are, the more your confidence will grow. But you must remember, I also believe it's a very thin line between arrogance and confidence. And, and it's a trick to be on that line the whole time. And we knew that we were good enough at that stage and that we deserved to be in the final. But we were, again, getting to a final. The, 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 the uh, media said, it's wonderful, it's great. Nobody really gave us a chance because we were so long out of international rugby that we will get to a final, let alone against the old enemy, the All Blacks, and let alone against the hot favourites, the All Blacks. So if we don't win the final, this is the way they play to get to a final. But again, saying this without sounding arrogant, that's not how we saw it. I mean, we, we made a pledge to each other way before the World Cup started that all the months and years we've sacrificed and the effort we put in, it's a kiss, but who the hell wants it? So why bother going all the way? You've got to win a final if you get to it, if you get the opportunity. Yeah, I, 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 I've got great respect for England and, and, and the Wallabies and playing the French and the Irish. And those are test matches and those are very important. But from a South African Supreme point of view, there's no doubt that the ultimate test has always been for us to play in the All Blacks. And I know they feel it. Exactly the same. Sean Fitzpatrick said to me once, we do not regard ourselves as two All Blacks if we haven't played South Africa. Uh, and, and it's always been that rivalry uh, between our countries. Now, in the final itself, there was a very interesting exchange that took place during the All Blacks Haka. These days, we see teams standing on their 10-meter line. The All Blacks are on their 10-meter line almost when the Haka takes place. And in between, you only have TV cameras and photographers. But you guys were on the halfway line, and you actually stepped forward to challenge them back. So much so, that by the time Jonah Lomu jumped, you were actually in his face. Who came up with that idea? Peter, yeah, the, the haka is, in my opinion, um, one of the uh, most important parts of world rugby. It's something I personally have always liked watching it, um, seeing the, the All Blacks doing the haka. I think it's an important part of world rugby. Uh, and I think one should face the haka. It, it is uh, disrespectful, in my opinion, not to face the haka. I know it means a hell of a lot to, to the All Blacks and to uh, the Kiwi. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot of talk before the final. What are we going to do? Are we going to face the Haka? Um, and we decided as a team, uh, we don't fear the Haka. We will show respect by facing them um, and as close as possible. Um, then it just sort of evolved from there. You know, the, the, the All Blacks um, saw that we were up for the battle and they, uh, and they started moving closer. They were also fired up. Of course, it's a World Cup final. And we ended up... Uh, you know, eyeballing each other as close as you saw. So it was, it was quite an experience, but I think it was, uh, it was all part of the hype of the final and, and contributed to a great final. 
Now, I've actually watched that final back a few times over the years, and except for maybe two times in the first 20 minutes or so, where the All Blacks broke through a first-time tackle, I don't think that South Africa at any stage uh, in that match looked uncomfortable. In fact, if anything, I think that the, f- uh, the final scoreline flattered the All Blacks. The fact that it went to extra time flattered the Kiwis. I'd like to know, playing in that match, did you feel that you guys were in control? Yes, and again, I hope I don't sound arrogant. Although it was a close game and any World Cup final should be close, as you've said, I agree with you 100%. Um, I think we were a far better team on the day uh, and in control than the scoreline actually suggests. There was two, two occasions where we were over the line, which were definite today. Those two tries would have been given hands down, but the one-eyed Ed uh, Morrison uh, uh, didn't. The second, Rupert Kruger went over. Uh, uh, as I said, today, those tries would have been given uh, uh, 14 points and put that, uh, that to the score. That would have broken the back of the camera, in my opinion. What does it feel like when the referee blows the final whistle and you are a Rugby World Cup champion? Yo, I've been asked that question probably 100,000 times. I can answer it in 100,000 different ways, Peter. But it's like Table Mountain was lifted off of my shoulders and, and the rest of the team. The pressure, the expectation, the hard work, um, the commitment, the sacrifice uh, in that very moment was all worthwhile. Uh, and you forget about all the pain, all the knocks, all the disappointments. Um, in that very moment, you know, that's what you've been working for. That's really what it's about. And you've been, and you are in that second become part of a very selected few and privileged men to, to lift that Web Ellis Trophy. Uh, and I say privilege because it is privilege. Uh, uh, not a lot of people. And then again, against the old enemy, I keep on saying that because I, I've got great respect for the All Blacks, but uh, at home, at Ellis Park, in Johannesburg, was just phenomenal. First test after that World Cup was against Wales, also at Ellis Park in Johannesburg. And you became quite well acquainted with one Derwin Jones. Tell me about that. Uh, I was hoping you were not going to get to that question. Uh, it was just one of those things, unfortunately. We, we are very good friends, and I'm not being sarcastic. They were myself. We open chat. Uh, it was just one of those things, heat of the moment. Um, I'm not proud of it, but it, it just happens. And uh, uh, unfortunately, did that day. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sent off, but I was fined afterwards. It was the first, uh, the first professional uh, fine of the professional era. And about a year later, Andre Markroff had become the Springbok coach and he dropped quite a bombshell by omitting Francois Pinar from the touring squad for that end-of-year tour uh, to Argentina, France uh, and Wales. We actually became the first team in about a decade, I think, uh, to win a test series in France. I'd like to hear from you how it was that the team was able to move forward from such a bombshell like Francois being dropped to seemingly becoming quite a happy unit. I think it was also a great group of players. Again, the core coming from uh, from the World Cup winning squad from Kitchen. Andre Mafrov is a great coach. He's probably one of the top three coaches that I've ever played under. It was a happy team, like the World Cup squad. Also worked very hard. We believed in each other. And yes, uh, the decision was made by Andre um, to to uh, to pick a new captain and Gary Tyson, which I also have great respect for. And and, I, and we could sense in the beginning, uh, Peter, there was a there was I think from Gary's side. You know, he was maybe worried that uh, the core, again, coming from the Lions, that because of what happened, that Francois was left out of the side, that we won't back him. And, 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 and I said it very clearly. I said, guys, uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, and the rest of the guys I, I know I speak on their behalf, that we will equally support Gary Tashman as well as we did Francois, uh, because it's our duty and because um, he's a great captain also and a great player. And then that was also the end of your test career. You didn't play again for the Springboks after that 96 end of year tour. How did that come about? I, You know what? I, I had a function once with Dave Richardson, the cricketer, and, and um, he just retired. And, and I said to him, Davey, how, how did you know? How does one know? And he said to me, I remember clearly, uh, well, you don't. I said, what do you mean? I also didn't plan it. I was playing with the best rugby at least. Um, but Dave said he was he was in the nets. He was hitting the ball. And he got up and he said to his wife, "That's me. I'm retiring." And he walked away. And he's and he and he's not. Um, uh, you know, it was the right decision. With me, it was exactly the same. Well, I've been so immensely blessed. I've reached every goal uh, uh, I wanted to, to reach or could reach in rugby. Um, uh, it's time for me to move on to something else. And 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 although I said earlier I could have played two or three years more. Um, 
it was the right decision. Um, and, and, and again, I look back with fond memories um, that I made the right decision at the right time. Okay, Kurbis, we're going to take another look at that trivia question again from earlier. Name the Springbok who scored a hat-trick of tries against the All Blacks at Ellis Park in a 2004 Tri-Nations test. Do you know the answer, Quervis? I do, because he's from my alma mater, Paul Jim, it's Marty Schubert. Yes, well done. Congratulations. A great day for the old school and a great day for the Springboks, who went on to win the Tri-Nations that year as well. Quervis, thank you so much for your time. It really was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Anytime. Thanks for asking me, Peter. I really enjoyed it. And uh, well done with the great show you're putting up. I uh, hope you have some... Uh, some great more guests uh, talking to you but thanks again thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed that video why not spear tackle the like button you can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from front row rugby see you next time front row rugby interviews with rugby legends with peter stemmett